And uh, my name is Cynthia Cook, and I'm the president of the Clinton Historical Society. And um, welcome. We're delighted to have uh, a nice group of you together tonight. And um, before I introduce our speaker, A.J. Shankman, who is speaking on patriots and spies in revolutionary New York, I just want to do um, a little few bits of, um, of advertising about um, programs and activities at the Clinton Historical Society. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, um, this is one of our, our monthly First Friday programs. And our very next one will be a political program in honor, political history program, in honor of Election Day. And it is going to be presented by Mark Lytle, an emeritus, emeritus professor of history at Bard College. And he's going to be speaking about the 1944 presidential election, which is the only uh, presidential election in which both candidates were from the same county. And of course, that happened to be Dutchess County. And um, then in December, uh, it will not be the first Friday, but it'll be the second Friday, I believe, December 16th, we have a very special program, which is going to be held in person over in the Clinton Town Hall. And it is the Germond Family Murders by Dr. Vincent Cookingham. And this is a celebrated and unsolved murder of a story from uh, the murder of four family members here in, um, well, in Upton Lake um, in 1930. So I hope you will um, tune in or be with us for those. We also know that, um, that we're in the middle of our fall tag sale. There is one more day down at the Creek Meeting House. And then on um, Saturday, the 22nd of October is the Progressive Dinner. If you are interested in the Progressive Dinner, go to our website and click on um, our contact information, info at clintonhistoricalsociety.org. Um, also, just looking ahead, we have holiday um, auction and dinner on Friday, December 2nd, followed by the Holiday Crafts Fair um, on Saturday, December 3rd. So lots of things going on, and um, I hope, hope to see a lot of you there and um, um, have a good season together. But now we have, the, um, we have a real treat tonight. Um, I've just had a few minutes to talk with A.J. Shankman, and he's, he's really, really engaging. And this is just one of a number of books and articles that he's written, but this one happens to have won the um, 2022 Best um, Book, Best Book, Hudson Valley Book by Hudson Valley Magazine. Um, so it's called the um, Best Author of 2022 by Hudson Valley Magazine. And um, I think that's quite an honor. He is also the town historian in Gardner, New York. He's a seventh grade social studies teacher. He formerly was the consulting historian at Historic Huguenot Street. And I think one of the nicest things I just learned is that he donates the proceeds from his books. And so the proceeds from the, this book on the revolutionary spies and patriots is, um, is going to a um, thrift store, People's Place in Kingston. So I think you're going to love him. And um, I think he's going to tell you everything you need to know about this fascinating story of patriots and spies in New York's Hudson Valley. So can you take it away, AJ? Yes, yes. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, I put my, um, you know what, let me stop to share a little bit because maybe somebody wants to see the boys because I feel like I'm the great Oz right now. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I think somebody might have slipped me some caffeine. So it's definitely going to be high energy um, mm -hmm. this late at night. Um, as far as, um, I'm A.J. Shankman, and um, we're going to be delving into patriots and spies. We're going to be delving into um, really three stories that I really kind of love. Um, let me go to, to the um, sharing the screen right now. Let's see if I can, I think that's it. I hope that's it. Yes, that's it. Um, so as um, was previously said, 
Um, and let's see, just having a little bit of technological difficulty. There we go. Um, all the royalties are going to go to People's Place. Um, it's a non-for-profit organization feeding, clothing, and responding to the needs of people in Ulster County with kindness, compassion, and the preservation of human dignity since 1972. Um, they've expanded, um, and it's a thrift store and a food pantry. Um, I was a first responder for many, 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 many years, um, all volunteer. Um, and I really believe that um, you got to get back to the community. Uh, and um, I saw that especially during uh, the pandemic with my students. And I know some people are like, well, we just have to give him respect because he's a seventh grade social studies teacher. But I absolutely love teaching seventh graders. And it's an emphasis on New York. Um, and I believe that um, at that age, you're going to kind of have to hook them young to get them into um, to buy into the local historic sites and to buy into history. Um, you know, so these great places and these historical societies um, are going, are, will have another generation past me. So uh, continuing right along, um, as we said, I'm, uh, I'm a history teacher, Wallkill Central uh, School District, best, best author of the Hudson Valley. Um, uh, I've been doing interviews from uh, London to LA and from San Francisco uh, to Tennessee. Um, I just Absolutely, have always loved history my entire life. Um, and the latest book that just came out uh, is Unexpected Bravery, which is about women and children of the Civil War. And um, it's enjoying a like national, um, you know, uh, people are loving it nationally. It's being reviewed nationally. And also, um, I just came back, well, not just came back, uh, talking at Gettysburg, um, at the Gettysburg Heritage Center. Um, the way I write and the way I'll talk tonight um, is kind of the way I teach uh, in terms of I really like to bring the people alive. I'm less into the battles and what these great generals were doing and who they were hanging out with. Um, Many years ago, I read an article by um, a Dr. Gorin, I think his name was, G-O-R-E-N. And he, um, he said that he was a fan of the underbelly of history. And that's, I don't know if I'm doing the underbelly as much as I am. I like to talk about those people whose only testament that they were alive might be a headstone in a cemetery. Um, and unexpected bravery, I feel I really kind of accomplished that. Um, it was a heart-wrenching book to write, by the way. Um, other books, uh, other best-selling titles, Murder and Mayhem in Ulster County uh, and Wicked Ulster County, um, which also includes some of Duchess, a fellow by the name of Big Bad Bill, the Gardner Desperado, um, our own Jesse James. And then... Um, a history of the Wallkill Central School District. And that was, uh, I believe the proceeds to that went to the Alumni Association for the 75th anniversary um, of the Wallkill Central School District, the consolidation. And um, our land, a lot of our property was given to us by the Bordens. Um, you know, Elsie Borden, um, not Elsie Borden, Marion Borden, Elsie the Cow, that whole um, history. And during my time as a consulting historian, um, we redid the old Huguenot burying ground um, uh, pamphlet that um, Ruth Heidgert had done many, many years ago. And in the process, found a headstone that had never been cataloged, which was quite interesting. And then finally, um, the Hasbrook family. Um, it, my first book was Washington's headquarters in Newburgh. Um, and it was more just high interest pictures and tipping my hat to those 19th century, early 20th century souvenir booklets. And then Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, home to a revolution, um, which is still um, enjoyed by uh, people today. And it's not so much about Washington's headquarters as it is about the Hasbrook family um, who built it and their home became Washington's headquarters. So 
Last but not least, um, I have not been updating the podcast. I apologize, but I did start a podcast on Apple called The History Knickerbocker. I try to do a new story every two weeks, um, and it's mostly about upstate New, new York history, but I also include uh, New York history as well. I think I did one on the uh, history of the Oreo. So getting into the research, um, I'm dating myself with Colombo there. Um, researching this book um, was difficult because a good part of it was done around the pandemic. Um, also, uh, my father, who was much more well-known than me, um, he was the driver for the public advocate for New York City, uh, part of police intelligence. Um, just about the time I was working on this book, um, he was killed in New York City. He was hit on his bicycle. Um, and I had to pour my grief into some appropriate way. And I started it by researching, which again, once the pandemic took off, um, it became very, very difficult. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that research and some of the issues, and then I'm going to get into my um, the actual, uh, some of the people that are in the book. So one of the issues when researching the American Revolution um, is the British, um, not the actual war with the British in the Revolutionary War, but the War of 1812 when they burned Washington, D.C., um, a lot of valuable archives were burned um, and um, pension papers, things that we probably will never even know were there. So researching a lot of the primary sources right there, there's an issue. Um, the other issue is the 1911 New York State fire, New York State archives fire. Um, during that, a little quote that I pulled, indeed, um, during the, I'll try to say it, conflagr conflagration, not a single book could be rescued from the library proper. The fire destroyed 450,000 books, 270,000 manuscripts, the entire catalog of almost 1 million cards. It was truly one of the greatest library disasters of modern times. Despite the hour, crowds gathered to watch. Sheets of scorched paper from books and historical manuscripts filled the sky over Albany, quote, like snowflakes, end quote, and would drift to the earth over a 20-mile radius. So one of the large part of the papers that I use, the Clinton papers, uh, Governor George Clinton's papers, um, those were almost entirely destroyed. But thankfully, Hugh Hastings, uh, around 1890, had transcribed a lot of these papers. Um, and so they were in effort saved. One of the people that I talk about in my book, Cornelius Hasbrook, um, cor um, a, uh, the depositions that are cited in the Clinton papers, luckily were not destroyed. So I was able to piece together what ha uh, what happened to Cornelius Hasbrook in my book, um, and he is uh, actually branded as a um, as a thief because he steals continental cattle um, in 1781. But some other issues that we have: the pandemic, um, and having to occasionally hire people that were able to be in on the archives to uh, do some of the research for me. And in some cases, I just couldn't proceed or I had to go to another story. Also, one of the things that I found um, in when I was uh, researching is it's not like the Civil War where you have a highly literate population. There's not a lot of letters. There's not a lot of diaries. There's not a lot of memoirs by the common folk. Um, it, it, the Civil War is almost complete opposite. So you don't, you only have a finite amount of materials. And for those of you who know Monty Python, and now for something completely different. So one of the people that I um, very early on uh, found very interesting, um, first of all, it's Patriot Molly Pitcher, the real Molly Pitcher. 
Um, and this is the Battle of Fort Washington, November 16, 1776. And to my right, if you've ever gone up the Major Deegan Expressway by Yankee Stadium, you see that huge tower. And as a kid, my father used to tell me it was a fort. It wasn't a fort. In fact, it's the High Bridge Water Tower. Uh, num many, many years ago, I believe it burned or they were redoing the, uh, the top of it. And that was the uh, High Bridge Water Tower from 1866 to 1949. Um, if you're going past Yankee Stadium, it would be on your left if Yankee Stadium is on your right. And um, it's nearly 200 feet tall and stands around uh, 174th Street in Washington Heights. And the tower used to hold 47,000 gallons of water um, that was fed by the Croton Aqueduct. Um, I don't discuss him, but the Croton Aqueduct feeds into another story in the book, um, Enoch Crosby, um, who uh, is an interesting individual. Um, and in the high bridge next to it was the last leg of the aqueduct, 40 mile journey from upstate New York to Manhattan, and is the oldest surviving bridge in New York City. The reason I'm talking about the high bridge water tower, because that's Fort Tryon, and that's where our story begins. So you might say that this whole story began as a little boy because I didn't grow up here. Um, I didn't grow up in the Hudson Valley, but in another valley called Queens Valley, um, which is uh, in Kew Garden Hills outside of a now large city, but you know, but used to be a uh, very long time ago, a little Dutch uh, town called Flushing. So I will make this a little bigger so you can see it where it is right now. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, do, 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 do. Technology. I am definitely not a guru. I want to be one. I really do. Um, so things like that do not happen. Um, so uh, the area that we're talking about right now would be around where the George Washington Bridge is today. Uh, for, it goes to Fort Lee, which is on the other side. You have the Hudson River. On the back end there, you have the Harlem River. Okay, you have Harlem Heights. And I circled the area that we're talking about. And specifically, the area that we'll be focusing on is Laurel Hill. Okay, and Laurel Hill is important on, on November 16th. Um, 1776. Where are we looking at um, in modern day today? Let's see if I can do that again. Um, there we go. We are looking right here at what's known as the Little Dominican Republic, okay, by the Little Red Lighthouse, Washington Heights, Inwood Park, that whole area in that in there. A really nice area too. Um, and let me zoom out. So again, we're near the George Washington Bridge, known as Fort Tryon Park, named after the last governor, uh, royal governor of New York. And quote, nearby Laurel Hill Terrace dates back to the time before the revolution when it was covered, surprise, with laurel bushes. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Army constructed a fort on a westerly ridge at what is now Fort Washington Avenue between 181st Street and 186th Street. So who is Molly Pitcher? First of all, she's called Molly Pitcher because, first of all, her name is uh, Margaret, but Pitcher is also because she uh, carried water to the troops to people that were working on the cannons. Um, so Margaret Cochran is her name. And Margaret Cochran is born in Franklin, Pennsylvania, 11-12-1752. Um, she marries an individual by the name of John Corbin, who we don't know a lot at, about. Uh, he's born circa 1772. And by 1775-76, uh, John enlists in the Pennsylvania artillery. Molly is a camp follower. In the, Re in the Revolutionary War, or I should say in the Civil War, camp followers are a fancy way of saying they're prostitutes or just around that uh, part of life. 
Uh, Molly is not a prostitute. In the Revolutionary War, these are mothers, their daughters, their sisters, their wives that are following their um, families um, through, in, in some cases, throughout the conflict, and they're taking care of them um, as well, doing laundry, feeding them, bringing them water. Um, as I tell my students, the American Revolution gets this kind of uh, discussion or it gets this idea that it was some kind of gentleman's war. Um, there was a lot of bad things that happened and women um, felt very vulnerable during that period of time as well. Um, so they sought the safety of the troops. And as far as General Washington, uh, General Washington um, sees it as the bane of his existence. Uh, he really wants them gone um, because they're a, a real drag on the military. So um, Fort Washington on November 16, 1776, it's the last chapter in the disastrous New York campaign, George's uh, uh, disastrous New York campaign. Um, and it is the first attempt by the um, British to gain control of the Hudson River. Uh, they believed if they could sep separate the um, middle colonies from the New England colonies, they could bring the war to an end. Uh, as late as 1777, they still are believing that Boston is the head of the snake, uh, specifically Massachusetts as well, and that they could take, uh, that they could chop the head off of the snake and end the war. Um, so George Washington, um, and this is just an overview, ordered General Green to defend the stronghold. Um, Fort Washington wrought havoc on British warships attempting to sail up the Hudson. And um, as far as some of the stats that we're talking about with this battle on November 16th, uh, George Washington is the American commander. He is um, at Fort Lee. And at one point, he is watching what's going on at um, Fort Washington. Uh, for the British, it's William Howe. Forces that are engaged are 11,000 American, 3,000 British, 8,000. The estimated casualty will be heavy on the British, um, and the casualties will be 613. So as the battle begins, John Corbin is an assistant gunner with the 1st Artillery Company on Laurel Hill. And Molly's bringing water to cool the cannon and water for thirst. Um, but also individuals who are firing muskets as well. Um, I uh, have participated in battles as a reenactor for New York State. And I know that when you're breaking open those um, uh, cartridges, uh, it just pulls all the water out of your mouth, all the moisture. So you need the water. Plus, the guns get hot, especially cannons. Um, and cannons can go off because there's embers that are in, that are still hot, that are in the cannon. So not only do you need the water to drink, but you also need it to swab the cannon as well. So during the battle, um, one of the men on Corbin's crew is struck and fell. Um, what is he struck by? Probably grape shot. Um, the British are, and the Hessians are using a lot of grape shot. It's a canister. Um, it's, uh, it's most akin to a, a shotgun blast. So once this person falls, Corbin takes up his position. Molly sees that they're one short and um, in her, with her husband's spot, and she takes that up in the crew. So John is killed. Um, Molly watches him, uh, torn apart by grape shot, and watches him fall. Without thinking, no time to grieve, she takes up his position when shortly after she is struck by grape shot. If you can just imagine this, um, a shotgun blast that rips through Margaret's body, her left arm is almost severed. Her jaw is shattered and she is also wounded in the chest. She falls and she is bleeding out. She's dying and she falls. So 
um, anecdotal history tells us she fell next to her husband. So Fort Washington surrenders on November 16th, 1776 at 3 p.m. And again, Margaret is laying next, laying lying, near, uh, near her husband. Um, and as soldiers are going through, the British soldiers, doctors, um, they see this woman. And at a closer look, an examination, the field doctor realized that she's in fact alive. And he calls to have her evacuated where she is brought to a field hospital and then to Fort Lee. Fort Lee across the river will be held by the Americans until November 20th, 1776. She is, um, Margaret is, or Molly, is granted parole by the British. Um, eventually, she makes her way to the Corps of Invalids at West Point, and she becomes known locally as Captain Molly. And I know we have Molly Pitcher from Monmouth, but this is believed to have been the first time that Molly Pitcher, the term name Molly Pitcher was used. But Molly Pitcher is just almost like a generic term um, for someone who brought water uh, to troops. Um, in 1779, the state of Pennsylvania grants her $30 for her services. She can't work. Imagine having an arm that's almost severed, a shattered jaw. Um, they just can't put her back to, uh, together like, you know, uh, combat medics could do today. So this woman also had an almost constant ration of rum. I can only imagine it was for the pain. I imagine that she probably could not eat very well either. Um, the same year, 1779, uh, the Continental Con Congress granted her a pension plus clothing. She is 100% a dependent. In 1780, it is noted that her conditions are deplorable again, and she is almost constantly in trouble. As the war, we get away from the war. First of all, we should say that she is married again, according to a captain, um, according to um, resources, I'm sorry, sources. Uh, she's married to a Captain Samuel Shaw, Shaw, who's also an invalid. It lasted a short period and he died. She's discharged from the army in 1783. She still cannot care for herself. She begins to get in trouble. And as we get away from the Revolutionary War, people begin to forget who she was. And she becomes a figure of scorn in the community. Um, and as people forgot to, uh, that her name was Captain Molly, they began to refer to her as Dirty Kate. Why? Because she's referred to as a sharp tongue alcoholic. Um, January 21st, 1800. She dies in Highland Falls, New York, and um, she's buried in a poorly marked grave. And in 1926, the Daughters of the American Revolution decide it's time to look for her grave. When we're starting to get that interest in the revolution again and the whole colonial revival, and they believe they had found it on the grounds of the J.P. Morgan property. A surgeon is called, a dentist. They determined there were similar injuries, um, and that's most likely her. She is given full military burial at West Point. So now let's fast forward to 2016. Behind the chapel at West Point in the cemetery, work is being done on the retaining wall near her grave when the grave is disturbed. And someone gets the idea, well, let's check it out. Let's see who she is. Let's see who this person is. In the 2016 Army Times, published, they published a story that through forensic evidence, it was not the remains of Corbin, but the remains of a man from a later period of time. There is no going back to those graves that were on the J.P. Morgan estate because the estate is gone. Um, if I remember correctly, I think it's a golf course and a housing development. But her grave was still honored as that of Molly 
uh, pitcher. So, and that's what J.P. Morgan's uh, Craxton estate um, uh, looked like back in the day. All right. So, one of the other stories, which is um, uh, very, very interesting to me, I find that my audiences love it. Um, it's about the spy Tory Ettrick. It's an uh, anecdotal history of a failed kidnapping of General Washington. Um, in more likelihood than not, it didn't happen, but it's just still such an interesting story. I've been trying to track down the origin of it. Um, it's uh, Rutenberg um, talks about it in, I think, his history of, I believe, New Windsor, if my memory um, serves me correctly. And also Carlos E., um, I think it's Godfrey, in 1904, um, cites it in the Commander in Chief, his book on the Commander in Chief's Guard. So um, Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, uh, where General Washington's longest headquarters of the war is from April of 1782 to August of 1783. Um, it's the Hasbrook House. It was built by Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook, uh, built on an earlier house that had been built um, by a Berger Mindersey. Um, and he purchases it too loud um if we could just uh please be on mute and i'll take questions uh towards the end um thank you um so um washington arrives in um april of 1782 and it's the home at that point of trench hasbrook colonel jonathan hasbrook having died in 1780 it's described as located quite out of town at the crossroads of two roads. One of those was the King's Highway. It's close to the Continental Ferry. A dismal swamp ran parallel, parallel to the river. Now, if you've been to Newburgh, there is a railroad down by the waterfront. You have the Newburgh waterfront. You have the Quisaic that runs into the Hudson. And there is an area there that is known as the Vale of Avoca. And it's a deep gorge that connects directly to the Hudson River. But first, the commander in chief's guard for a little bit of the backstory. And there's me at Washington's headquarters when I was in my 20s um, and uh, dressed as one of the commander in chief's guard. Um, had so much fun doing that as well. So the Commander-in-Chief's Guard is formed March 11, 1776. It's charged with the mission to protect George Washington and also to be with him in battles. Um, he wanted a, quote, corps of sober, intelligent, and re reliable men, end quote. He, meaning Washington, wishes them to be from 5 feet 8 inches high to 5 feet 10 inches handsomely and well made. So I think right there, I could I could have been one, judging by that picture. So dismantled, is disbanded in June 1783. Now, despite surviving war, weather, and constant movement, the vast majority of the records were destroyed in a fire at the Charleston Navy Yard in 1815. So there's a picture of the Vale of Oka before we get into the story. It does not look like that anymore. Um, it's been mined. It's been developed. It's uh, factories are up there, but it was a real pretty place back in the day. And it is here that the Tory Ettrick with his daughter made their home. He was a well, relatively wealthy man. And when he heard that Washington was at the Hasbrook house, he sent a, um, a, a letter of introduction and asked Washington to be his guest for dinner. Washington did not say no. He uh, accepted the invitation. Washington was known to visit local gentry in the community and also to stay out quite late and sometimes not even to bring his commander in chief's guard. So he would be expected back late. So between the time he gets the invitation and the time he accepts it, Ettrick's daughter, knocks on the door of Washington's headquarters and asks to speak to the general. When he, she is um, introduced to the general, she said, General Washington, 
you're coming to dinner at our house and my father plans on having local loyalists kidnap you after you're done with dinner. And then you will go and then they're going to uh, whisk you away to a boat uh, on the Hudson to New York City, where they will just parade you through the streets as a captive. Washington thought for a bit. He consulted with uh, the commander in chief's guard and they begged him not to go. He said, I am going to go, but this is what I'm going to do. I am going to go alone and the commander in chief's guard will show up later during supper and you will surround the house and we will capture the Tory Ettrick. So while they're eating dinner, Washington's finishing up. The Tory Ettrick hears horses and hears all kinds of scuffling outside the house. And he believes that it's the, his loyalists that are here to arrest the commander in chief. Washington, still eating away, Tory Ettrick walks up to him across the table, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, I regret to inform you, General, but you are my prisoner. Anecdotally, anecdotally um, Washington never even looked up, but put his, um, his, uh, put his utensils down and said, I beg your pardon, sir, but I believe that you, in fact, are my prisoner. And when Tori Etrick looked out, he saw that they were the commander in chief's guard. He was promptly arrested and he was going to be tried and executed. When the Tory Ettrick's daughter found out about this, she begged General Washington to spare the life of her father. She said, he is my only means of support. And if I'd known you were going to kill him, I would not have um, given you this information. Washington thought for a few, and he said, I will spare his life, but the two of you must leave and go to New York City and to never return. And that's what they did. Um, when I tell the story to my students sometimes, and not every year, um, I tell them that in a story, there's a lot of things that you can pull out of it. And one of the things that we don't really talk about with the um, American Revolution is that it was a civil war and it split families Probably the most well-known is Benjamin Franklin and William Franklin, his son. Um, it split up the Iroquois. Um, and again, and right in little communities, their you know, families are split over their loyalty to either the king or to the patriots. So again, maybe one day something will be uh, found. Um, when I was studying uh, Cornelius um, um, Hasbrook, um, I was told that he went to Nova Scotia um, and that he was a Tory and he left in 1776. And when I was looking for information on one thing, found another. And sure enough, Cornelius Hasbrook was in Canada after stealing continental cattle. Um, but he was in Upper Canada and he left much later. Um, so there's an example of uh, maybe something will be found one day, but I would like to think that had Washington almost been kidnapped, um, that it would have made it into his papers because he wrote about just about everything. So I do, I believe, say in the book that this is, you know, probably more uh, a legend. Uh, you know, uh, it's all anecdotal. Um, there's no real proof to it, but I included it because it's just such an interesting story. Um, so the next story, we're going to remain around Newburgh. Um, just, I just have such a love of Newburgh, the second place I have such a love of, um, and I promise I won't go on about it, um, is definitely um, Hyde Park. I believe in a different life. I lived in, uh, um, in uh, Newburgh, and, and then uh, maybe I lived in Hyde Park. So maybe I was a Delano in, in, in a past life. Um, and if anybody wants to buy me the Del Delano Mansion, it is on sale for, I think, $2.5 million. And I'll let you visit anytime you want. Um, a Patriot Falls for a Baroness. 
So we talked about the campaign of 1776 and the attack on Fort Washington and Fort Lee. This is the British campaign of 1777. Again, not to go into um, detail, I'm just checking to make sure we have some time. Um, this is that one where um, General Howe is supposed to head up to Albany to meet General Burgoyne. Um, St. Ledger is coming from the West. They're all going to meet in Albany and they are going to take control of the Hudson. We know that Howe uh, goes to Philadelphia um, as a diversionary tactic and he sends Clinton um, who finds out that Saratoga has happened and um, he is pretty much, uh, he burns Kingston, burns Claremont, heads back uh, to New York City. Uh, prior to that, St. Ledger is held back at Oriskany and we know um, in Bemis uh, Heights and Freeman's Farms, uh, Burgoyne is uh, defeated. I also have a story that's attached to this, the spy Daniel Taylor, um, who uh, swallowed the famous uh, silver bullet um, and was hung as a spy in Hurley. Uh, he confused uh, George Clinton with uh, Henry Clinton, which is always an interesting story. Um, and I have some information in there that has not really been, um, it, it's not uh, real common knowledge. So, on the 17th of October, the capitulation was consummated. The generals waited upon the American general in chief Gates and the troops laid down their arms and surrendered themselves prisoners of war. The Baroness von Rietzel from her diary. The Baroness was married, who else? To the Baron von Rietzel. And he was um, part of a, uh, the, a Hessian army um, that was defeated at the Battle of Saratoga, the Battles of Saratoga, and the Baroness kept a diary um, from the time that she leaves what we would refer, refer to today as Germany, and she um, uh, comes here to uh, the Americas to be with her husband, eventually into New York, and her diary is a really rich resource um, of the time period about the surrendered Saratoga, and afterwards when she ends up in Newburgh. And there is a picture of her. And so um, October 30th, 1777, George Washington sends to Gates by this opportunity. I do myself the pleasure to congratulate you on the single uh, signal success of the army under your command in compelling General Burgoyne and his whole force to surrender themselves prisoners of war, an event that does the highest honor to the American arms and which I hope will be attended with the most extensive and happy consequences. So what happens after the surrender? Well, you go to, you go to, um, to major, you go to general Gates and um, you eat dinner. Okay. So, um, and you talk about the terms of surrender. And eventually a convention was negotiated with Burgoyne by General Horatio Gates, and the prisoners became known as the Convention Army. The Baron and the Baroness and their family and their um, uh, servants are part of that Convention Army. Where do you go? Well, you go to Philip, Philip J. Schuyler's house is the first stop for the Baron and Baroness. And um, I guess he wasn't really uh, uptight about the fact that um, his house um, had been destroyed by the British, um, another house that he had, ha he had. So from Saratoga, they go to Boston, from Boston to Cambridge. Um, by December 1777, then they go from Cambridge to Fishkill, New York. Now, why aren't they supposed to go to Britain? The Convention Army is supposed to go to Britain. They're supposed to sail from Boston. The Bostonians don't want them there. So they have to go and camp in, uh, in Cambridge. Um, but there's a lot of shenanigans going on. And they do not get there. Um, instead, the Baroness and elements of the Convention Army end up going to Fishkill, New York. 
Um, by November 1778, they have left Cambridge. They're being escorted by Colonel Robert Troop. I hope I pronounced that one right. And by December 19, 1778, she writes in her diary, we were obliged to wade up to the knees through a morass. Still, we came to the home of a Colonel Harbone, believed to be Hasbrook, a very rich man where we were to lodge. So remember that swamp that um, ran along the Hudson? Uh, they had to wade through that to go up to the Hasbrook house. So who is Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook? Um, his, the wife, his wife is Trencher Du Bois. She's born circa 1730, uh, dies circa 1799. Um, and out by uh, the Ulster County Fairgrounds is around where she would have lived. Joseph Hasbrook um, is the father of Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook. He is the husband of Elsie Schoonmaker. Um, if you want to visit the Schoonmaker Farm, it is the second oldest farm in the United States. Um, it is in Accord um, and uh, right on 209. Joseph Hasbrook's home is across from uh, the winery on Albany Post um, Road. And Joseph is the son of the patentee or the person who settled um, one of the people who settled uh, New Paul's and Maria Deo. Um, so that is the grandfather of Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook. Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook is in 1775, a member of the Committee of Safety for Newburgh and later Colonel in the 4th Ulster Militia. 1776 to 1777, um, he's working on Fort Montgomery and he resigns from the 4th by the time the Baroness arrives due to ill health. He is a miller and a merchant. In 1767, he is listed as the richest man in Newburgh. He's not quite up at the Colden's level, but he is not far from it. So when the Baroness arrives, um, Hasbrook is out in the fields probably out in one of his meadows, or he is down at the um, uh, one of his many mills along the Quisaic. And he enters into the room of seven doors and one window. And he, according to the um, Baroness, he looked like a bear. He was not clean shaven. His hair was not kept. And he also, um, his west waistcoat was dirty. He looked completely filthy. And there were some not, um, unnice words exchanged between the Baroness and Colonel Hasbrook. He seemed to be perturbed that there were Hessians warming themselves or servants warming themselves by the fire, the Dutch fireplace. And he reportedly kicked one of them and said, is it not enough that I give you shelter, ye wretched royalist? And she records that in her diary. So she doesn't have a real good opinion of Colonel Hasbrook. The second meeting is going to be in the newer part of the house, which is going to be in the parlor, which is built in the 1770s. And this is where the Baroness, the Baron is still over in Fishkill, um, and the Baroness is with her children in, um, staying in uh, what's known as the Hasbrook Parlor. It's an English style parlor. And she also changes there. And when she's changing, everybody vacates the room and except her servants. And so frequently you have Hessians that are sitting around the, uh, around the um, Hasbrook residence also warming themselves by the fire because it is cold. It's a cold time of year. And a lot of times, Trencha would invite the Baroness to have coffee or tea with, um, with her. So while the Baroness uh, is having tea or coffee, we're not sure of which, with um, Trencha, Hasbrook appears again. He's cleaned himself up a little bit. The beauty of the Baroness is legendary. And 
as she enters to um, he enters the parlor, she gets up to leave and he blocks her exit. She wants and she says, I just do not want any more incivilities. Would you please let me go? And he refuses. And he says, quote, I am not so rude as you imagine, said he, she writes. I like you. And if I were not married, I cannot tell, but I might fall in love with you. I am very rich. This whole estate is mine. My wife, you see, is old. You will do well, therefore, to remain. The Baroness is quite put off with, with Colonel Hasbrook and basically states to him that if you were the last guy on the face of the earth, I wouldn't marry you. And she exits. And that is the last time that the Baron um, and Colonel Hasbrook um, have any kind of interaction that the Baroness talks about. Now, there's somebody that's going to say Harburn. Um, in, the, in the book, it says Harburn. How do you get Hasbrook from Harburn? I kind of agree with that. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So the Rizals request to remain for the remainder of the winter at the Hasbrook house. So where are the Hasbrooks mentioned? Well, they are mentioned in the Clinton papers. So as far as um, an individual by the name of Boyd writes to Clinton and is quoted in his papers, from what I have been informed concerning the gentleman's conversation, meaning the Baron, who is now at the Hasbrook house, since in this neighborhood, I think him a dangerous man. So in the papers of Governor Clinton, letters between Boyd and Clinton, he refers to the Baron and Baroness staying at the Hasbrook house. Um, and in Newburgh, there is only one Hasbrook house at that point. All right. And that house would have been Colonel Jonathan's house. So he definitively states that is where they're staying. And the time that they were staying there is the time of the papers. So eventually they get their walking papers um, and they are forced um, to winter over the wall kill, what, what is referred to as the High Dutchers. From February 1779 to August 1779, the Von Rietzel stayed in Virginia until around August of 1779. Um, she writes in her diary, which I think is kind of funny, the Virginians are mostly indolent, the Baroness recorded, which is ascribed to their hot climate. But with the slightest inducement, they are ready in an instant to dance. And boy, did General Washington love to dance. So you're saying, hey, uh, Shankman, that's not Mount Vernon. No, it is not. They stayed a short distance away from Monticello, Jefferson's home. And in fact, Jefferson invited the Reedsels to dine at Monticello. Once they leave Virginia, they head to New York City. And from New York City, eventually, they head back to what we would call today um, Germany. And that is, uh, concludes my, my talk of three people um, in, or three events in my book. Um, if you'd like more information, uh, www.ajshankman.com. Also, you can read a lot more about people I've written about at newyorkalmanac.com. All of this is also on my website. Um, and again, I talk a lot about different individuals such as Ann Bates, Nathan Hale, Enoch Crosby. I talk about the uh, Marbletown conspiracy where Tories are leaving Marbletown in Ulster County um, to um, hook up with uh, other loyalists uh, in White Plains to head to New York City uh, to help defeat um, the Patriots. Um, so a lot, a lot of good stuff. The way I divided, divided up the, um, the book is, um, by different regions of New York state, uh, uh, the Mohawk Valley. And we talk about, um, I talk about in there, um, uh, the Western frontier, which is Ulster County and, uh, Joseph Brandt, 
um, and some of the um, loyalists that head on down there. Um, and also, um, then I talk about the Upper Hudson, um, the Mid Hudson, the Lower Hudson, and then New York City and Long Island. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. I just want to close the door real quick. Um, if you um, have any questions, I definitely will entertain those. And of course, if you don't feel comfortable asking the questions or you think of one later, um, you're more than welcome um, to use my contact form on my website um, to um, ask those questions. So I'm going to stop the share. And here I am again. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and um, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead. Well, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you. I think that was a, a great talk and very, uh, very informative. Thank and you. You're, I can see the teacher in you. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> even <very> this late. <laughs> <laughs> even this late at night, you mean, or no? Yeah, yeah, I taught all day. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, you're you're still going strong. Well, thank you very much. I, I will <laughs> say this: um, a question is usually asked. Where do you find the inspiration? And I find it from my students and the questions that they ask and the way they see things sometimes is different than mine. Mm. And, um, and you, know, you always have to keep one step ahead of them. Yeah. So I think I should mention your background since you haven't, but oh, um, okay. <laughs> it's instantaneously recognizable to some of us. Um, does, can anybody, anybody else besides me Identify what's um, where AJ is sitting. When... Follow, come here, follow, down <laughs> boy. <laughs> it's the uh, it's the big library at um, Springwood in Hyde Park. So he's using that as his at his backdrop. At, at first, I thought, wow, he's got quite the quite the mansion there. But uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty soon, I realized where it was. But it's a uh, it's really interesting. The picture should give it away. The portrait in the back. I think that's that ice. But your hand is right in front of that. Now, okay. Well, that's um, that's uh, FDR's great grandfather, Isaac the Patriot. Yes. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. And right now, where they're putting that shop right in, or it's already there. That was Roosevelt Land as well. That was know, the original mansion. Yeah. Well, they Getting started again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, do we have any questions from the from the audience? I have one. Yes. Uh oh. Uh oh. No. Um. Did you run across anything about the Revolutionary War in our area here in in Dutchess County? Not so much Southern Dutchess, but up here. Um, for instance, I have to do more work on this, but I understand that one of the friends, the Quakers, that mm -hmm. was involved in building the Creek Meeting House, which is our headquarters. Mm -hmm. was in fact imprisoned either in Kingston or in a prison ship outside of Kingston. Did you hear anything like that? Was there a prison or a prison ship? Um, there was a prison ship. I believe there was one in the Rondout. And if my memory serves me correct, L. Nathan Foster was there, uh, in there. Um, and then, of course, um, I have a picture somewhere of it. There was the... Um, they were also put in the uh, jail in Kingston. In fact, one of Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook's sons, Cornelius, is branded. And they also had a, um, a uh, gallows there as well. Uh, the only Quakers that I know about, um, which I'm starting to research a little bit about, are the uh, fighting Quakers. But they're uh, in the uh, uh, Civil War. Um, and, um, and as far as Duchess, um, the person that I come across is uh, Enoch Crosby, who's one of the first spies, but that's down Fishkill way. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting. We have we have a lot. I mean, we we need to do a lot of work. We don't we don't have our own history. Completely. Let's do it. Let's write a book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to do some work on the Quakers, so I I hope to learn a little bit more in the next in the next few months or so, next year maybe. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I see we have Gregory Edmonds here um, from our, he did a program with us um, on the Red-Tailed Angels. So there's another uh, Roosevelt connection. He's joining us from Ohio. 
So, oh, okay, okay. Uh, nice to see you, Greg. And um, I, I see a lot of familiar names here. So I, I know a lot of you must have, have questions. Let's... Uh, well, if you have a question, don't forget to unmute yourself first. That's right, that's right. Um, I mean, one of the things that I found really uh, interesting when I was writing is I, I always tell my students so much happened in New York. I mean, New York was really a battleground and especially Western, the Western frontier. Um, and I lived in um, Krahongson, uh for a while when I first moved up this way. And um, when you're going up and down 209, all those uh, New York State Education Department signs, of all these things that that, you know, that happened, uh, forts that were burned and, you know, Joseph Brent, um, you know, down in Napanock and, um, you know, and, you know, and, you know, even uh, Daniel Taylor, um, you know, and, uh, you know, in the uh, silver bullet, you know, being caught by uh, uh, General George Clinton, um, you know, and it's retribution for the killing of Nathan Hale. Um, and there's a lot of a new information that's coming out is, um, as I've said before to people as well, that um, history is constantly changing. And one of the things that's changing is that um, I know at Hug Historic Huguenot Street occasionally, uh, unfortunately, um, I believe I have my story straight, someone had a fire in their house. And when they were doing overhaul much later, uh, they found a strong box. And in that strong box um, in this very old house were all these letters and all the stuff about Fort Montgomery. And um, and they had no idea that that was there. Sometimes when people are going through places in their home, they find information. Uh, one of them um, was about Nathan Hale, um, a letter that basically who portrayed him. Um, and um, so, you know, so, and, and I find a lot of that stuff um, very, very exciting as well. You know, um, uh, I mean, when I wrote current, uh, the book on J Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook, it was um, the history changed after I published it. Um, somebody came to Huguenot Street and said, I have all this information about Colonel Jonathan Hasbrook that I found. Do you want it? <laughs> Including one of his slaves who was purchased in um, Fishkill from a Cornelius Swarthout. And I think 1765. So there's a lot of Duchess connections. Um, but yes, I should definitely want to research some more though. Here's, um, a, here's a question. Oh, okay. From me. I, I hope okay. I can get some questions from other people. That's fine. It always struck me as odd that Fort Washington and Fort Lee were named after generals at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fort Montgomery, of course, Richard Montgomery was a martyr, yeah. but mm -hmm. so here they're building these forts and they're naming, I mean, they're naming them after themselves. So um, and, for, and Fort Lee, um, if I remember correctly, wasn't Lee, um, he was on um, Washington's bad side at one point. Um, uh, he, in, uh, in, in, in New York City, uh, he actually... If I remember it correctly, he was an unstable individual and just used to badmouth um, Washington. Um, I don't know. I know that uh, Fort Clinton and Fort Montgomery, Fort Clinton um, was uh, named after Governor Clinton. I don't know the exact why they named certain forts, you know, different for names. Isn't it odd that they named them after themselves, though? <laughs> um, I think so. I definitely uh, think so. Um, and I, you know, but I, I get a kick out of the fact that um, my students get confused about um, all the Clintons that are involved in Fort Montgomery um, and the battle. And then we said, wait, so a Clinton was fighting a Clinton? Were they related? And I said it was basically called the Battle of the Clintons. Yeah. Um, you know, so and I um, mean, I love making those connections. I mean, not to keep going back to Newburgh. But, you know, I tell them where the whole thing happened, where Daniel Taylor was caught, where well, um, where uh, uh, Clinton's uh, General George Clinton's headquarters is. I said, you know, when you go past the mall at Adams Faker, Farragher Farms and past the Walmart. And I said, and there's that turn. You can go left towards Vail Gate or right towards the airport. There's that sign. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There used to be a house there. What happened to it? Like a lot of old houses. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're gone. And I remember coming through there and that was farms. 
right where where I go to get Starbucks was a farm. <laughs> yeah. you know. any, any other questions from from our our audience? I and that's what FDR was trying to save, right? He was trying to save those old houses. Well, or or rebuild them, in or the rebuild form, them yeah. in the form of post offices and uh, yep. schools and other other buildings, mostly post offices. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, yeah, uh, it's Teresa. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how to phrase this question because it's over my head, but I don't know if where the quake when the Quakers came to this area because it's a huge Quaker area in the day. Obviously, we have a lot of meeting houses here, and it's very mm -hmm. important to our organization. But were the Quakers here during the revolutionary period? And well, yeah, I mean, the I assume so from a age of the Creek Meeting House. Right. But but the question I have is: Has anybody considered writing about the interaction between the Quakers and um? The Patriots and the British. There may well be something written. What I beg your pardon? There may well already be something written, which I'll have to find out about. But the Quakers began coming into this area in 1740, 41. Um, first, they were over in the Oblong, you know, in Eastern Duchess, and then moved up um, into the Nine Partners meeting. Uh, which I think started in a log cabin, and then um, that burned down. They built another one in, what, 1750 or so. That burned down, and the present brick house, meeting house, was built in 1780. Um, but of course, this this meeting house in, in Clinton Corners was an offshoot of the Nine Partners meeting, and it was built throughout the revolution. And this was a period that increasing numbers of friends were coming up to this area to get away from the um, hostilities down in New York and um, in the lower Hudson Valley and Long Island. So they were um, becoming more numerous. Um, Did they fight eight. in the Revolutionary War? Quakers? No. No. All right. They actually, there was one, there was one group in Philadelphia. Okay. I think they call themselves the Free Quakers, but they, there, there was one group of, um, Quakers down there, I believe. And I remember they had a meeting house um, not too far from. But we really don't know the position um, or the relationships between um, AJ. You, you don't know anything about the relationships or haven't investigated that between, as I said, them being in the smack in the middle of being pacifists while all these wonderful things you're describing to us were going on. We're, you know, It'd be interesting to to look, to look into that, perhaps. I, I agree. I agree. The only um, the reason I asked did any of them fight is because in um, Ulster County there were during the Civil War uh, there were uh, fighting Quakers. There were uh, Quakers that actually took up arms, um, which goes right against that. But I don't really know much about um, you know what you're talking about. But now it's kind of got me really interested um, about it. And I might have to, uh, when my children's book, after my children's book is published, maybe um, I'll start delving into it. Though I'm actually, um, I just pitched another book about um, Hispanics in the Civil War, uh, like 20,000 served, including there was an underground railroad, so to speak, uh, in Texas, the Tejanos, um, uh, were ferrying slaves into Mexico, where slavery had been uh, out what since 1829. I lived in the Fort Tryon area for about 15 years when I was in my early marriage because mm -hmm. it was next to a Presbyterian hospital where I was supposed to work. But um, it's a great tour spot that a lot of people don't know about. The park. The oysters. It's, it's fabulous. I mean, yep, yep. And a lot of, beside the cloisters, there's just the whole area is. Um, and the park is is absolutely lovely. And the views you're showing are still there. <laughs> now, um, before I met my wife, I, I dated a doctor at Columbia Presbyterian. And uh, we used to go to Inwood Park and we'd explore the, uh, the caves. And, uh, right. and I mean, there's just so much the culture that's there. 
Um, there was just so many cliffs, uh, the cloisters, the- Interestingly, it was an right. interesting neighborhood that I lived on off Fort Washington and 190th Street. Mm, okay. And it was a mixture of Germans, which is interesting. Yes, were, yes. Were, were, they had great pastries too. They had mixtures of German Jews Mm -hmm. didn't associate at all with the German Germans that were there. And actually Henry Kissinger's mother was in the nursing home that was on 190th. Now, interestingly <laughs> enough, a lot of German Jews did early on did not associate with Eastern European Jews. In fact, they tried to assimilate them as quickly as possible because they felt as though they were going to bring too much um, attention. Yes. Um, so you had like almost like an intergroup anti-Semitism. I had that um, in my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in a prior life, um, <laughs> I started working on a doctorate. I stopped. Uh, Dr. M Thomas Monkhall said to me, I just enjoyed being a seventh grade social studies teacher so much. He said, there ain't no shame in it. And, um, you know, so I do plan on going back for a doctorate at some point. Um, but what I was studying, um, sorry to be heavy, um, I was a genocidal studies major. That's what I was going towards. So I was studying a lot about um, German Jews, Eastern European Jews. And then, you know, of course, you know, uh, the Holocaust and uh, Eichmann. And then it was Professor Houtman. Uh, from New Paul's, uh, I was very close to for a very long time, took me aside and he said, life is so hard on a good day. He goes, there's so much sadness. Do we have to make it worse by studying Eichmann? <laughs> oh, so, so I, which I, my I, daughter, which my daughter did at Duke. She was a, she was a French and French Holocaust major. Oh, oh I God. mean, that's a, you know, the French during the Holocaust, let's put it. It's tough. It's very tough. And I'm I'm 50, almost 54 years old. And I grew up with a lot of, I grew up in Kew Garden Hills, which was uh, Little Jerusalem. And I met early, my earliest memories asking my mom, what are those numbers on a, on a person's, you know, arm and stuff like that. Um, so, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, you know, I, I just kind of, um, I don't know, I got too jaded. I got too stressed out reading about all this stuff, but I did speak to, we are off in a whole nother direction. Um, I actually spoke to the guy who tackled Eichmann. Um, I spoke through someone else to Elie Wiesel. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he would answer letters and phone calls, but he would not answer any kind of emails, I think is what it, they said. And um, he always would, and we read night in, in one of my classes, and I wanted my cho some of my students to write to him. Um, mm -hmm. And he always answered uh, letters from children, but we just never kind of got around to it. But there's so many people out there. Yeah, I spoke to Yehuda Bauer uh, um, also. Um, and it's just so many people that are just so accessible out there um, that are, you know, that are witnesses to history. I, I think it's, you know, we're getting a little bit off of our... Of yes, our, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Of the, of the American Revolution. But it's fun. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, yes. It yes, might yes. not be to everybody's... Um, I, I started with the Quakers, at least it was more... So I, I just wonder, do we have um, any other questions about, um, you know, about the, the spies and the patriots or um, anything like that? Oh, hi, this is Mary Ellen. Um, I just have a question about... Um, you know, to actually, to me, it's kind of sad right now. I'm from Newburgh. I grew up in Newburgh, but I had zero interest in anything historical at the time. Uh -huh. And um, now I live over here in Pleasant Valley. But I'm just curious, when did you develop your love of history? Um, oh, my God. Um, I worked on the only working farm left in Queens. It's a Dutch farmstead. My dad used to take me to battlefields. Um, you know, like um, Civil War, Revolutionary War. Um, I, I just always remember Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, and I grew up in a really kind of weird time. Um, one of my dad's closest friends, mother, uh, would talk to me about going across the country from Minnesota to the Dakotas in a covered wagon. 
And, you know, and so those always meant so much to me. And I think as far as Newburgh, Newburgh, I worked at Washington's headquarters, State Historic Site, and also Dr. Houtman um, telling me in college, all these things that happened in this city that no one even knew about, like Washington's refusal of the crown, um, the Newburgh mutiny, that pretty much maybe the second or third place that was known that the war came to an end was in Newburgh. You know, so Newburgh was just an amazing city. And then right into the 19th century and early 20th. And um, I love Newburgh. I go back there every chance that um, that I get. And so many good things are happening there. So many good people. And I think one of the oldest cemetery burial grounds in uh, New York State is there um, off Grand Street, uh, the Old Town Burial burial. So, which is, you know, and they're even doing great things. They just rehabilitated a whole bunch of stuff there. So, but revolutionary city. And of course you have Kingston too. That's why Kingston calls itself revolutionary city. Any other questions, comments? Well, I think we've had a very interesting session here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We've raged over a lot of different topics. But um, had a nice a nice overview of some of the spies and patriots of the of revolutionary New York. So I thank you for and being thank here. you for providing that structure and pulling me back in. It's usually my wife that does it. <laughs> my husband who came and told me to do it. So <laughs> oh, okay, All right. thank you. <laughs> so anyway, any any other comments? I just want to thank everybody um, for for joining us. I think this was one of our uh, most interesting talks and uh, oh thank you thank you it was um, very energetic and exciting so thank you AJ for being with us tonight thank you and hopefully um uh I can uh, do this again one day uh, in person yeah maybe that would be nice we can look at some of your other some of your other topics and uh, yes yes yeah. okay well thank you everybody and uh good night be safe healthy and all that great stuff thank okay. you Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.